When it comes to building new habits, you can use the connected connectedness of behavior to your advantage. One of the best ways to build a new habit is to identify a current habit you already do each day and stack your new behavior on top. This is called habit stacking. Habit stacking is a special form of an implement implementation intention. Rather than pairing your new habit with a particular time and location, you pair it with a current habit. This method, which was created by BJ Fogg as part of his Tiny Habits program, can be used to, to design an obvious cue for clearly any habit. Habits, the habit stacking formula is, after current habit, I will new habit. For example, meditation. After I, cup, I, I pour my cup of coffee each morning, I will meditate for one minute. Exercise. After I take off my work shoes, I will immediately change to my workout clothes. Gratitude. After I sit down to dinner, I will say one thing I'm grateful for that happened today. Marriage. After I get into bed at night, I will give my partner a kiss. Mm. Safety. After I put on my running shoes, I will text a friend or a family member where I am running and how long it will take. The key is to tie your desired behavior into something you already do each day. Once you have mastered this basic structure, you can begin to create larger stacks of chaining small habits together. That's fire. This allows you to take advantage of the natural momentum that comes with one behavior leading into the next. A positive version of the D Diderot effect. Your morning routine habit stack might look like this. After I pour my morning cup, my morning cup of coffee, I will meditate for 60 seconds. After I meditate for 60 seconds, I will write my to-do list for the day. After I write my to-do list for the day, I will immediately begin my first task. Or consider this habit stack in the evening. After I finish eating dinner, I will put my plate directly into the dishwasher. After I put my dishes away, I will immediately wipe down the counter. After I wipe down the counter, I will set out my morning coffee mug for tomorrow morning. You can also insert new behaviors into the middle of your current routines. For example, you may already have a morning routine that looks like this. Wake up, make my bed, take a shower. Let's say you want to develop the habit of reading more each night. You can expand your habit stack and try something else. Wake up, make my bed, take, place a book on my pillow, take a shower. Now, when you climb onto bed each night, a book will be sitting there waiting for you to enjoy. Overall, habit stacking allows you to create a set of simple rules that guide your future behavior. It's like you always have a game plan for which actions should come next. Yeah. Once you get comfortable with this approach, you can develop general habit stacks to guide you whenever the, situa the situation is appropriate. Exercise. When I see a set of stairs, I will take them instead of using the elevator. Social st skills. When I walk into a party, I will introduce myself to someone I don't know yet. Finances. When I want to buy something over $100, I will wait 24 hours before purchasing. Healthy eating. When I serve myself a meal, I will always put veggies on my plate first. Minimalism. When I buy a new item, I will give something away. One in, one out. Mood. When the phone rings, I will take one deep breath and smile before answering. Wow. Forgetfulness. When I leave a public place, I will check the table and the chairs to make sure I don't leave anything behind. No matter how you use the strategy, the secret to creating a successful habit stack is selecting the right cue to kick things off. Unlike an implementation intention, 
which specifically states the time and location for a given behavior, habit stacking implicitly has the time and location built into it. When and where you choose to insert a, ha a habit into your daily routine can make a big difference. If you're trying to add meditation into your morning routine, but mornings are chaotic and your kids keep running into the room, then that may be the wrong place and time. Consider when you are most likely to be successful. Don't ask yourself to do habits when you're likely to be occupied with something else. To do a habit. Your cues should also have the same frequency as your de desired habit. If you want to do a habit every day, but you stack it on top of a habit that only happens on Mondays, that's not a good choice. One way to find the right trigger for your habit stack is by brainstorming a list of your current habits. You can use your habit scoreboard from the first chapter as a starting point. Alternatively, you can create a list with two columns. In the first column, write down the habits you do each day without fail. For example, get out of bed, take a shower, brush your teeth, get dressed, brew a cup of coffee, eat breakfast, take the kids to school, start the work day, eat lunch, end the work day, change out of work clothes, sit down for dinner, turn off the lights, get into bed. Your list can be much longer, but you get the idea. In the second column, write down all of the things that happen to you each day without fail. For example, the sun rises, you get a text message, the song you're listening to ends, the sun sets. Armed with the, these two lists, you can begin searching for the best place to layer your new habit into your lifestyle. Habit stacking works best when the cue is highly specific and immediately actionable. Many people select cues that are too vague. I made this mistake myself. When I wanted to start a push-up habit, my habit stack was when I take a break up for lunch, I will do 10 push-ups. At first glance, this sounded reasonable, but soon I realized the trigger was unclear. Would I do my push-ups after I ate lunch? But would I do my push-ups before I ate lunch? After I ate lunch? Where would I do them? After a few inconsistent days, I changed my habit stack to When I close my laptop for lunch, I will do 10 push-ups next to my desk. Ambiguity gone. Habits like read more or eat better are worthy causes but these goals do not provide instruction on how and when to act. Be specific and clear. After I close the door, after I brush my teeth, after I sit down on the table, at down at the table, specificity, yeah, I said that right. Specificity is important. The more tightly bound your new habit is to a specific cue, the better the odds are that you will notice when the time comes to act. But it's like the same thing for what I'm doing right now. Like at 5 a.m., I mean at 5 p.m. every day, I'm reading a book. You know what I'm saying? So it's like a, a, a cue. You know, that's really important. Specificity. Yes, sir. The first law of behavior change is to make it obvious. Strategies like implementation intentions and habit stacking are among the most practical ways to create obvious cues for your habits and design a clear path for when and where to take action. Chapter Summary The first law of behavior change is make it obvious. The two most common cues are time and location. Creating an implementation intention is a strategy you can use to pair a new habit with a specific time and location. The implementation look intention formula is I will behavior at time in location. 
Habit stacking is a strategy you can use to pair a new habit with a current habit. The habit stacking formula is after current habit, I will new habit. Number six, motivation is overrated. Environment often matters more. Anne Thorndike, a primary care physician at Massachusetts General Hospital in Boston, had a crazy idea. She believed she could improve the eating habits of thousands of hospital staff and visitors without changing their willpower or motivation in the slightest way. In fact, she didn't plan on talking to them at all. Thorndike and her colleagues designed a six-month study to alter the choice architecture of the hospital cafeteria. They started by changing how drinks were arranged in the room. Originally, the refrigerators located next to the cash registers in the cafeteria were filled with only soda. The researchers added water as an option to each one. Additionally, they placed baskets of bottled water next to the food stations throughout the room. Soda was still in the primary refrigerators, but water was now available at all drink locations. Over the next three months, the number of soda sales at the hospital dropped by 11.4%. Meanwhile, sales of bottled water increased by 25.8%. They made similar adjustments and saw similar results. With the food in the cafeteria, nobody had said a word to, any, to anyone eating there. Here's the cafeteria chart before and after. If you're on YouTube, you can pause and look at it. Uh, figure eight, here is a representation of what the cafeteria looked like before the environment design changes were made to the left and after to the right. The shadow boxes indicate areas where bottled water was available in each instance. Because the amount of water in the environment was increased, behavior shifted naturally and without additional motivation. People often choose products not only of, not, not because of what they are, but because of where they are. If I walk up into the kitchen and see a plate of cookies on the counter, I'll pick up half a dozen and start eating, even if I hadn't been thinking about them beforehand and didn't necessarily feel hungry. If the communal table at the office is always filled with donuts and bagels, it's going to be hard not to grab one every now and then. Your habits change depending on the room you are in and the cues in front of you. Environment is the invisible hand that shapes human behavior. Despite our unique personalities, certain behaviors tend to arise again and again under certain environmental conditions. In church, people tend to talk in whispers. On a dark street, people act wary and guarded. In this way, the most common form of change is not internal, but external. We are changed by the world around us. Every habit is context dependent. In 1936, psychologist Kurt Lewin wrote a simple equation that made a powerful statement. Behavior is a function of the person in their environment. Or B equals F times P E. It didn't take long for Lewin, Lewin's equation to be tested in business. In 1952, the economist Hawkins Stern described a phenomenon he called suggestion impulse buying, which is triggered when a shopper sees a product for the first time and visualizes a need for it. In other words, customers will occasionally buy products not because they want them, but because of how they are presented to them. For example, items at eye level tend to be purchased more than those down near the floor. For this reason, you'll find expensive brand name featured in easy to reach locations in stores shelves because they drive the most profit. 
while cheaper alternatives are tucked away in harder to reach spots. The same goes for end caps, which we are which are the units at the end of aisles. End caps are money making machines for retailers because they are obvious locations that encounter a lot of foot traffic. For example, 45% of Coca Cola sales come specifically from end of the aisle racks. The more obviously available a product or service is, the more likely you are to try it. People drink Bud Light because it is in every bar and visit Starbucks because it's, in, it's on every corner. We like to think that we are in control. If we choose water over soda, we assume it's because we wanted to do so. The truth is, however, that many of the actions we take each day are shaped not by purposeful drive and choice, but by the most obvious option. Every living thing, every living being has its own methods of sensing and understanding the world. Eagles have remarkable long distance uh, vision. Snakes can smell by tasting the air with their highly sensitive tongues. Sharks can detect small amounts of electricity and vibrations in the water caused by a nearby fish. Even bacteria has chemoreceptors, tiny sensory cells that allow them to detect toxic chemicals in their environment. In humans, perception is directed by the sensory nervous system. We perceive the world through sight, sound, smell, touch, and taste. Excuse me. But we also have other ways of sensing stimuli. Some are conscious, but many are unconscious. For instance, you can notice when the temperature drops before a storm, or when the pain in your gut rises during a stomach ache, or when you fall off balance while walking on rocky ground. Receptors in your body pick up on a wide range of internal stimuli, such as the amount of salt in your blood or the need to drink when thirsty. The most powerful of all human sensory abilities, however, is vision. The human body is about 11 million sensory has about 11 million sensory receptors. Approximately 10 million of those are dedicated to sight. Wow. Some experts ex estimate that half of the brain's resources are used on vision. Given that we are more dependent on vision than any other sense, it should come as no surprise that visual cues are the greatest catalyst of our behavior. For this reason, a small change in what you see can, live to, can, can lead to a big shift in what you do. As a result, you can imagine how important it is to live, in a work, to live and work in environments that are filled with productive cues and devoid unproductive ones. Thankfully, there is good news in this respect. You don't have to be the victim of your environment. You can also be the architect of it. Okay, okay. How to design your environment for success. During the energy crisis and oil embargo of the 1970s, Dutch researchers began to pay close attention to the country's energy usage. In one suburb near Amsterdam, they found that some homeowners used 30% less energy than their neighbors. Despite the homes being of similar size and getting electricity for the same price, it turned out the houses in this neighborhood were nearly identical except for one feature, the location of the electrical meter. Some had one in the basement, others had the electrical meter upstairs in the main hallway. As you may guess, the homes with the meters located in the main hallway used less electricity when their energy use was obvious and easy to track, people changed their behavior. Every habit is in initiated by a cue, and we are more likely to notice cues that stand out. Unfortunately, 
the environments where we live and work often make it easy not to do certain actions because there is no obvious cue to trigger the behavior. It's not easy to practice the guide the to practice the guitar when it's tucked away in the closet. It's not easy to read a book when the bookshelf is in the corner of the guest room. It's easy not to take your vitamins when they are out of sight in the pantry. When the cues that spark a habit are subtle or hidden, they're easy to ignore. Mm. By comparison, creating obvious visual cues can draw your attention towards a desired habit. In the 1990s, a cleaning staff at Schip Schiffel Airport in Amsterdam installed a small sticker that looked like a fly near the center of each urinal. Apparently, when men stepped up to the urinals, they aimed for what they thought was a bug, but the stickers improved their aim and significantly reduced spillage around the urinals. Further anal analysts Analysis determined that the stickers cut bathroom cleaning costs by 8% per year. Wow. I've experienced the power of obvious cues in my own life. I used to buy apples from the store, put them in the crisper in the bottom of the refrigerator, and forget all about them. By the time I remembered, the apples would have gone bad. I never saw them. So, I never ate them. Eventually, I took my own advice and redesigned my environment. I bought a large display bowl and placed it in the middle of the kitchen counter. The next time I bought apples, that was where they went. Out in the open, where I could see them. Almost like magic, I began eating few apples each day simply because they were obvious rather than out far up sight. Here are a few ways you can redesign your environment and make the cues for your preferred habits more obvious. If you want to remember to take your medication each night, put your pill bottle directly next to the faucet on the bathroom counter. If you want to practice guitar more frequently, place your guitar, guitar stand in the middle of the living room. If you want to remember to send more thank you notes, keep a stack of stationery on your desk. Stationery, keep a stack of, are they like sticky notes? You know what that is? I don't know what that is. Stationery? Like they use that in like a weird, keep a stack of stationery. Keep a stack of stationery. Writing paper, writing materials that's pens, pencil, paper, and pills. So yeah, like kind of sticky notes, I guess. All right. Keep a stack of stationery on your desk. If you want to drink more water, fill up a few water bottles each morning and place them in common locations found in the house. If you want to make a habit a big part of your life, make the cue a big part of your environment. The most persistent behaviors usually have multiple cues. Consider how many different ways a smoker could be prompted to pull out a cigarette, driving a car, seeing a friend smoke, feeling stressed at work, and so on. The same strategy can be employed for good habits. By sprinkling triggers throughout your surroundings, you increase the odds that you'll think about your habits throughout the day. Make sure that the best choice is the most obvious one. Making a better decision is easy and natural when the cues for good habits are right in front of you. Environment design is powerful not only because it influences how we engage in the world, but also because we rarely do it. Most people live in the world others have created for them. But you can always, I mean, but you can alter the spaces where you live and work to increase your exposure to positive cues and reduce your exposure to negative ones. Hmm. Environment design allows you to take back control and become the architect of your life.
Be the designer of your world and not merely the consumer of it. The context is the cue. The cues that trigger a habit can start out very specific, but over time, your habits become associated not with a single trigger, but with the entire context behave, be, be surrounding the behavior. For example, many people drink more in social situations than they would ever drink alone. The trigger is rarely a single cue, but rather the whole situation. Watching your friends order drinks, hearing the music at the bar, seeing the beers on tap. We mentally assign our habits to the locations in which they occur. The home, the office, the gym. Each location develops a connection to certain habits and routines. You establish a particular relationship with the objects on your desk, your items on your kitchen counter, the things in your bedroom. Our behavior is not defined by the objects in the environment, but by our relationship to them. In fact, this is a useful way to think about the influence that the environment ha of the environment on your behavior. Stop thinking about your environment as filled with objects. Start thinking about it as filled with relationships. Think in terms of how you interact with the spaces around you. For one person, her couch is the place where she reads for an hour each night. For someone else, the couch is where he watches television and eats a bowl of ice cream after work. Each people can have different memories and thus different habits associated with the same place. The good news, you can train yourself to link a particular habit with a particular context. In one study, scientists instructed insomniacs to get into bed only when they were tired. If they couldn't fall asleep, they were told to sit in a different room until they became sleepy. Over time, subjects began to associate the context of their bed with the action of sleeping, and it became easier to quickly fall asleep when they climbed in bed. Their brains learned that sleeping, not browsing on their phones, not watching television, not staring at the clock was was the only action that happened in that room. Wow. The power of context also reveals an important strategy. Habits can be easier to change in a new environment. It helps to create a subtle the subtle triggers and cues that nudge you towards your current habits. Go to a new place, a different coffee shop, a bench in the park, a corner of your room you seldom use, and create a new routine there. It is easier to associate new habits with new contexts than to build a new habit in the face of competing cues. It can be difficult to go to bed early if you watch television in your bedroom each night. It can be hard to study in the living room without getting distracted if that's where you always play video games. But when you step outside your normal environment, you leave your behavioral biases behind. Huh. You aren't battling old environmental cues, which allows new habits to form without interruption. Huh. Whoa. I'm, my brain. Whoa. Want to think more creatively? Move to a bigger room, a rooftop patio, or a building with expansive art, art, Arctic Architecture, architecture, Jesus. Take a break from the space where you do your daily work, which is also linked to your current thought patterns. Trying to eat her healthier, it is likely that you shop on autopilot at your regular supermarket. Try a new grocery store. Huh, you may find it easier to avoid unhealthy food when your brain doesn't automatically know where it is located in the store. When you can't manage to get into an entirely new development, redefine or rearrange your current one. Create a separate space for work, study, exercise, entertainment, and cooking. The mantra I find useful is one space, 
one use. When I started my career as an entrepreneur, I would often work from my couch or at the kitchen table. In the evenings, I found it very difficult to stop working. There was no clear division between the end of work time and the beginning of personal time. Was the kitchen table my office or the space where I eat meals? Was the couch where I relaxed or where I sent emails? Everything happened in the same place. I'm not gonna lie, this is the same thing with me. Like everything happens right here on this desk. Hello? What? Hmm. A few years later, I could finally afford to move to a home with a separate room for my office. Suddenly, work was something that happened in here and personal life was something that happened out there. It was easier for me to turn off the professional side of my brain when there was a clear dividing line between work life and home life. Wow. Wow. Each room had one primary use. The kitchen was for cooking. The office was for working. Whenever possible, avoid mixing the context of one habit with another. Oh my God, bro. Oh my God. This is insane. This is insane. When you start mixing contexts, you start mixing habits, and the easier ones will usually win out. This is one reason why the versatility of modern technology is both a strength and a weakness. You can use your phone for all sorts of tasks, which makes it all which makes it a powerful device. But when you use your phone to do nearly anything, it becomes hard to associate it with one task. You want to be productive, but you, but you're also conditioned to browse social media, check emails, and play video games whenever you open your phone. It's a mishwash. It's a mishwash of cues. You may be thinking, "You don't understand. I live in New York City. My apartment is the size of a smartphone. <laughs> I need each <laughs> facts, bro. I need each room to play multiple roles. Not as facts. Fair enough. If your space is limited, divide your room into activity zones." A chair for reading, a desk for writing, a table for eating. You can do the same with your digital spaces. I know a writer who uses his computer only for writing, his tablet only for reading, and his phone only for social media and texting. Every habit should have a home. Wow, man. No, man, this is crazy. If you can manage, yo, I'm freaking out. My, my, my bad to, people, to the people on YouTube, bro. If you can manage to stick with this strategy, each context will become associated with the particular habit and mode of thought. Habit thrives under predictable circumstances like these. Focus comes automatically when you're sitting at your work desk. Relaxation is easier when you're at, at a, in a space designed for that purpose. Sleep comes quickly when it is the only thing that happens in your bedroom. If you want behaviors that are stable and predictable, you need an environment that is stable and predictable. Mm. A stable environment where everything has a place and a purpose is an environment where habits can easily form. Damn. Chapter Summary Small changes in context can lead to large changes in behavior over time. Every habit is initiated by a cue. We are more likely to notice cues that stand out. Make the cues of good habits obvious in your environments. Gradually, your habits become associated not with a single trigger, but with an entire context surrounding the behavior. The context becomes the cue. It is easier to build new habits in a new environment because you are not fighting against old cues. I'm so trying these out, bro. I'm so trying this out. Seven, the secret of self-control. Oh, this book is so good. Oh, my God. In 1971, as the Vietnam War was heading into the 16th year, Congressman Robert Steele from Connecticut and Morgan Murphy from Illinois 
made a discovery that stunned the American public. While visiting the troops, they had learned that over 15% of U.S. soldiers stationed there were heroin addicts. What? Follow-up research revealed that 35% of service members in Vietnam had tried heroin and as many as 20% were addicted. The problem was even worse than they had initially thought. The discovery led to a flurry of activity in Washington, including the creation of the Special Action for Office of Drug Abuse Prevention under President Nixon to promote prevention and rehabilitation and to track addicted service members when they return home. Lee Robbins was one, of the, was one of the researchers in charge in a finding that completely upended the accepted beliefs about addiction. Robbins found that when soldiers who had been heroin users returned home, only 5% of them became re-addicted within a year. And just 12% relapsed within three years. In other words, approximately 9 out of 10 soldiers who used heroin in Vietnam eliminated their addiction nearly overnight. This finding contradicted the prevailing view at the time, which considered heroin addiction to be a permanent and irreversible condition. Instead, Robbins revealed that addictions could spontaneously devolve, dissolve if there was a radical change in the environment. In Vietnam, soldiers spend, spent all day surrounded by cues triggering heroin use and it was easy to access. They were engulfed by the constant stress of war. They built friendships with fellow soldiers who were also heroin users, and they were thousands of miles from home. Once the soldier returned to the United States, though, he found himself in an environment devoid of those triggers. When the context changed, so did the habit. Wow, interesting. Compare this situation to that of a typical drug user. Someone becomes addicted at home or with friends, goes to a clinic to get clean, which is devoid of all the en environmental stimuli that prompt the habits, then return to their old neighborhoods with all their previous cues that caused them to get addicted in the first place. It's no wonder that usually you see numbers that are exact opposite of those in the Vietnam study. Typically, 90% of heroin users become re-addicted once they return home from rehab. Wow. The Vietnam studies ran counter to many of the cultural beliefs about bad habits because it challenged the conventional association of unhealthy behavior as a moral weakness. If you're overweight, a smoker, or an addict, you've been told your entire life that it's because you lack self-control. Maybe even because... Maybe even that you're a bad person. The idea that a little bit of discipline would solve all our problems is deeply embedded in our culture. Recent research, however, shows something different. When scientists analyze people who appear to have tremendous self-control, it turns out those individuals aren't all the time from, aren't all that different from those who are struggling. Instead, Disciplined people are better at st structuring their lives in a way that does not require heroic willpower or self-control. In other words, they spend less time in tempting situations. The people with the best self-control are typically the ones who need to use it the least. It's easier to practice self-restraint when you don't have to use it very often. So yes... Perseverance, grit, and willpower are essential to success, but the way to improve those qualities is not by wishing you were a more disciplined person, person but by creating a more disciplined environment.
Mm. This counterintuitive idea makes even more sense once you understand what happens when a habit is formed in the brain. A habit that has been encoded in the mind is ready to be used whenever the, re the relevant situation arises. When Patty Allwell, a therapist from Austin, Texas, started smoking, she would often light up her, her riding horses with a friend. Eventually, she quit smoking and avoided it for years. She had also stopped riding. Decades half after, she hopped on a horse, again found herself craving a cigarette for the first time in forever. The cues were still internalized. She just hadn't been exposed to them in a long time. Once a habit has been encoded, the urge to act follows whenever the environment and environmental cues appear. This is one reason behavior change behavior change techniques can backfire. Shaming obese people with weight loss presentations can make them feel stressed, and as a result, many people return to their favorite coping strategy, overeating. Showing pictures pictures of blackened lungs to smokers lead to higher levels of anxiety which drives many people to reach for a cigarette. If you're not careful about cues, you can cause the very behavior you want to stop. Bad habits are automatic, are auto-catalytic. The process feeds itself. They foster the feeling, the feelings they try to numb. You feel bad, so you eat junk food. Because you eat junk food, you feel bad. Watching television makes you feel sluggish. So you watch more television because you don't have enough energy to do anything else. Worrying about your health makes you feel anxious, which causes you to smoke and ease your anxiety, which makes your health even worth, worse and soon <laughs> You're feeling more anxious. I said worth. I mean, worth. It's a downward spiral, a runaway train of bad habits. Researchers refer to this phenomenon as cue induced wanting. An external trigger causes a compulsive craving to repeat a bad habit. Once you notice something, you begin to want it. This process is happening all the time, often without us realizing it. Scientists have found that showing addicts a picture of cocaine just for 33 milliseconds stimulates the reward pathway in the brain and sparks desire. This speed is too fast for the brain to consciously register. The addicts couldn't even, couldn't even tell you what they had seen but they create the drug all the same. Here is the punchline. You can break a habit, but you're unlikely to forget it. Once the mental grooves of habit has been carved into your brain, they are nearly impossible to remove entirely, even if they go unused for quite a while. And that means that simply resisting temptation is an ineffective strategy. It is hard to maintain a zen attitude in a life filled with interruptions. It takes too much energy. In the short run, you can choose to overpower temptation. In the long run, we become a product of the environment that we all live in. To put it bluntly, I have never seen someone constantly stick to positive habits in a negative environment. Ah, oh, interesting. The more reliable approach, I mean, a more reliable approach is to cut bad habits off at the source. One of the more practical ways to eliminate a bad habit is to reduce exposure to the cue that causes it. Okay, I got you. If you can't seem to get any work done, leave your phone in another room for a few hours. If you're continually feeling like you're not enough, Stop following social media accounts that trigger jealousy and envy. Mm. If you're wasting too much time watching television, 
move the TV out of the bedroom. If you're spending too much money on electronics, quit reading reviews about the latest tech gear. If you're playing too many video games, unplug the console and put it in a closet after use. I'm gonna add one for us PC gamers. If you're playing too many PC video games, uninstall the game. You know what I'm saying? This practice is an inversion of the first law of behavior change. Rather than make it obvious, you can make it invisible. Oh, that's fire. I'm often surprised by how effective simple changes like these can be. Remove a single cue and the entire habit often fades away. Self-control is a short-term strategy, not a long-term one. You may be able to resist temptation once or twice, but it's unlikely that you can muster the willpower to override your desires every time. Instead of summoning a new dose of willpower whenever you want to do the same thing, your energy will be better spent optimizing your environment. This is the secret, the secret, the secret shh, to self-control. Make the cues of your good habits obvious and the cues of your bad habits invisible. We're going to skip the chapter summary for this one, not gonna lie. And this is it right here. How to create, this, this is the charts right here, boom. How to create a good habit. It says, fought the habit score, scorecard, you know, write down your current habits and become aware of them. Use implementation intentions, I will, you know what I'm saying? Design your environment, make the cues of good habits obvious and visible. Boom. For bad habits, is reduce exposure, which would make it invisible. Remove the cues of your bad habits from your environment. It's not gonna lie, my hands are ashy. No cap. <laughs> Hello. All right. The second law: make it attractive. How to make a habit irresistible. In the 1940s, a Dutch scientist named Nico Tinbergen performed a series of experiments that transformed our understanding of what motivates us. Tinbergen, who eventually won a Nobel Prize for his work, was investing, I mean, investigating herring gulls, the gray and white birds often seen flying along the seashores of North America. Yeah, I've seen those. Adult herringbird gulls have a small red dot on their beak. And Tinbergen noticed that newly hatched chicks would peck this spot whenever they wanted food. To begin one experiment, he created a collection of fake cardboard beaks, just a head without a body. When the parents had flown away, he went over to the nest and offered these dummy beaks to the chicks. The beaks were obvious fakes, and he assumed that the baby word birds would reject them altogether. However, when the tiny gulls saw the red dot on the cardboard beak, they pecked away just as if it were attached to their own mother. They had a clear preference for those red spots. If they had been genetically programmed at birth, as if they had been genetically programmed at birth, soon Tinbergen discovered that the bigger the red dot, the faster the chicks pecked. Eventually, he created a beak with three large red dots on it, and he placed it when he placed it over the nest. The baby birds went crazy in delight. They pecked at the little red patches as if it was the greatest beak they had ever seen. Tinbergen and his colleagues discovered similar behaviors in other animals. For example, the gray lag goose is a ground nesting bird. Occasionally, as the mother moves around on the nest, one of the eggs will roll out and settle on the grass nearby. Whenever this happens, the goose will waddle over to the egg and use its beak 
and neck to pull it back into the nest. Tinbergen discovered that the goose will pull any nearby round object such as a billboard ball or a light bulb back into the nest. The bigger the object, the greater their response. One goose even made a tremendous effort to roll a volleyball back and sit on top. No way. What? Like a baby like the baby gulls automatically pecking at red dots, the gray lag goose was following an instinctive rule. When I see a round object nearby, I must roll it back into the nest. The bigger the round object, the harder I would try to get it. Huh. It's like the brain of each animal is preloaded with certain rules for behavior. And when it comes across an exaggerated version of that rule, it lights up like a Christmas tree. Scientists refer to these, ex to these exaggerated cues as supernormal no stimuli. A supernormal stimulus is a heightened version of reality. Like a beak with the three dots or an egg the size of a volleyball, it elicits a stronger response than usual. Humans are also prone to fall for exaggerated versions of reality. Junk food, for example, drives our rewards. Um, where was I? What the? Drives our reward systems into a frenzy. After spending hundreds and thousands of years hunting and foraging for food in the wild, the human brain has evolved to place a high value on salt sugar, and fat. Such foods are often calorie dense and they were, uh, they were quite rare when our ancient ancestors were roaming the savannah, the savannah. When you don't know where your next meal is coming up, eating as much as possible is an excellent strategy for survival. Today, however, we live in a calorie-rich environment. Food is abundant, but your brain continues to crave it like it's scarce. Placing a high value on salt, sugar, and fat is no longer advantageous to our health, but the craving persists because the brain's rewards centers have not changed for approximately 50,000 years. The modern food industry relies on stretching our pathiolithic path um, path instincts beyond their evolutionary purpose. A primary goal of food science is to create products that are more attractive to consumers. Nearly every food in a bag, box, or jar has been enhanced in some way, if only with additional flavoring. Comparing companies spend millions of dollars to discover the most satisfying level of crunch in a potato chip or the perfect amount of fizz in a soda. Entire departments are dedicated to optimizing how a product feels in your mouth. A quality known as oro oro sen, oro sensation, oro sensation. I don't know what that means, not gonna lie. Oro sensation. What is this book about? It's about habits. Oro sensation. Oro sensation. Is that the oral sensation? Okay, I think it's, it's the sensations you get from your mouth, I think. That's what I... Because oral is like a... Comes from oral sensation. So that's my guess for that. Even though it says, it says no... No... Oral, did I spell it right too? O-R-O-S-E-N. Yeah, I spelled it right. It's not there. So we're just going to guess that that's what it means. French fries, for example are a potent combination, golden brown and crunchy on the outside, light and smooth on the inside. Other processed foods enhance dynamic contrasts 
which refers to items with a combination of sensations like crunchy and creamy. Imagine the gooeyness of melted cheese on top of a crispy pizza crust or the crunch of an Oreo cookie combined with a with a smooth center. Mm. With natural unprocessed foods, you tend to experience the same sensation over and over. How's that 17th bite of kale taste? After a few minutes, your brain loses interest and you begin to feel full. But foods that are high in dynamic contrast keep the experience novel and interesting, encouraging you to eat more. Ultimately, such strategies and enable food scientists to find the bliss point for each product. The precise combination of salt, sugar, and fat that excites your brain and keeps you coming back for more. This result, of course, is that you overeat because hyper palatable foods are more attractive to the human brain. As Stephen Guyanet, a neuroscientist who specializes in eating behavior and odyssey says, we've gotten too good at pushing our own buttons. The modern food industry and the overeating habits it has spawned is just one example of the second law of behavior change. Make it attractive. The more attractive an opportunity is, the more likely it is to become habit forming. Look around. Society is filled with highly engineered versions of reality that are more attractive than the world our ancestors evolved evolved in. Stores features mannequins and with exaggerated hips and breasts to sell clothes. Social media delivers more likes and praise in a few minutes than we could ever get in the office or at home. Online porn slices together stimulated, stimulating scenes at a rate that will be impossible to replicate in real life. Advertisements are created with a combination of of ideal lighting, professional makeup, and photoshopped edits. Even the model doesn't look like that in person in the final image. These are the super are the super normal stimuli of our modern world. They exaggerate features that are naturally attractive to us, but our instincts to go wild, but our instincts go wild as a result driving us to excessive shopping habits, social media habits, porn habits, eating habits, and many others. If history serves as a guide, the opportunities of the future will be more attractive than those today. The trend is for rewards to become more concentrated and stimuli to become more enticing. Junk food is a more concentrated form of calories than natural foods. Hard liquor is a more concentrated form of alcohol than beer. Video games are a more concentrated form of play than board games. Compared to nature, these pleasure-packed experiences are hard to resist. We have the brains of our ancestors, but temptations they never had to face. If you want to increase the odds that a behavior will occur, then you need to make it attractive. Throughout our discussion of the second law, our goal is to learn how to make our habits irresistible. While it is not possible to transform every habit into a super normal stimulus, we can make any habit more enticing. To do this, We must start by understanding what a craving is and how it works. Okay. We begin by examining a biological signature that all habits share. 
the dopamine spike. The dopamine driven feedback loop. Scientists can track and wait, hold on, sorry. Scientists can track the precise moment a craving occurs by measuring a neurotransmitter called dopamine. The importance of dopamine became apparent in 1954 when the neuroscientists James o. Olds and Peter Milner ran an experiment that revealed the neurological processes, processes be behind craving and desire. By implanting electrodes in the brains of rats, the researchers blocked the release of both dopamine. To their surprise, the scientists, the loss that the, the rats lost all the will to live. They wouldn't eat. They wouldn't have sex. They wouldn't crave anything. Within a few days, the animals died of thirst. Wow. In follow-up studies, other scientists also inhibited the dopamine releasing parts of inhibited the dopamine releasing parts of the brain but this time they squirted little droplets of sugar into the mouths of the dopamine depleted rats their little rats faces lit up with pleasurable grins from the tasty substances even though dopamine was blocked they liked the sugar just as much as before they just didn't want it anymore the ability to experience pleasure remained, but without dopamine, desire is dead. Wow, bro. And without desire, action stopped. When other researchers re reversed this process and flooded the reward system of the brain with dopamine, animals performed habits at breakneck speed. In one study, Mice received a powerful, a powerful hit of dopamine each time they poked their nose in a box. Within minutes, mice developed a craving so strong they began craving, they began poking their nose into the box 800 times per hour. Humans are not so different. The average machine, uh, the average slot machine player, will spin the wheels six hundred percent per hour. Habits are a dopamine-driven feedback loop. Every behavior that 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 is highly habit-forming—taking drugs, eating junk food, playing video games browsing social media is associated with higher levels of dopamine. The same can be said for our most basic habitual um, behavior behaviors like eating food, drinking water, having sex, and interacting socially. For years, scientists assumed dopamine was as well, was all about pleasure. But now we know it plays a central role in many neurological processes, including motivation, learning, and memory, punishment, and aversion, and voluntary movement. When it comes to habits, the key takeaway is this. Dopamine is released not only when you experience pleasure, but also when you anticipate it. Gambling addicts have a dopamine spike right before they place a bet, not after they win. Cocaine addicts get a surge of dopamine when they see the powder, not after they take it. Whenever you predict that an opportunity will be rewarding, your levels of dopamine spike in anticipation, and whenever dopamine rises, so does your motivation to act. It is the anticipation of a reward, not the fulfillment of it, that gets us to take action. Interestingly, 
the reward system that is activated in the brain when you receive receive and reward is the same system that is activated when you an anticipate a reward. This is one reason an anticipation of an experience can often feel better than the attainment of it. As a child, thinking about Christmas morning can be better than op opening the gifts. And as an adult, daydreaming about an upcoming vacation can be more enjoyable than actually being on vacation. Uh. Scientists refer to this as the difference between wanting and liking. Here's a dopamine chart. I'm just going to pause this here for YouTubers, for the YouTube people. I'm going to skip this too. Figure nine. I'm going to skip that. Not going to lie. All right. Your brain has far more neural circulatory circuitry allocated for wanting rewards than for liking them. The wanting centers from the brain at large, the centers in the brain at large, the brain stem, the nucleus encumbrances, and ventral tegmental area. The dorsal stratum, stratum, the amygdala, the amygdala, and portions of the prefrontal cortex. By comparison, the liking centers of the brain are much smaller. They are often referred to as hedomic hotspots and are distributed like tiny islands throughout the brain. For instance, researchers have found that 100% of the nucleus incumbens is activated during wanted, wanting. Meanwhile, only 10% of the structure is activated during liking. The fact that the brain allocates so much previous space to the space to the regions res responsible for craving and desire provides further evidence of the crucial role these processes play. Desire is a is the engine that drives behavior. Every action is taken because of the anticipation that precedes it. It is the craving that leads to the response. These insights feel the importance, reveal the importance of the second law of behavior change. We need oh, wait, I lost my spot just now. Mm. We need to make our habits attractive because it has the expectation of a rewarding experience that motivates us to act in the first place. This is where a strategy known as temptation bundling comes into play. Tem temptation bundling. How to use temptation bundling to make your habits more attractable, attractive. Ronan Byrne, an electrical engineer student in Dublin, Ireland, enjoyed watching Netflix, but he also knew that he should exercise more often than he did. Putting his engineering skills to use, Byrne hacked his stationary bike and connected it to his laptop and television. Then he wrote a computer program that would allow Netflix to run only if the cycling, only if he was circling at cycling at a certain speed. If he slowed down for too long, whatever show he was watching would pause until he started pedaling again. In other words, in the word of one fan, eliminating obesity one Netflix binge at a time. Mm. He was also 
em- employing uh, temptation bundling to make his exercise habit more attractive. Temptation bundling works if flanking an action you do 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 with an action you need to do. In Burns' case, he he bundled watching Netflix, the thing he wanted to do, with riding his stationary bike, the thing he needed to do. Businesses are masters at temptation building, bundling. For instance, when the American Broadcasting Company, more commonly known as ABC, launched its Thursday night television lineup for for the 2014 and 2015 season, they promoted temptation bundling on a massive scale. Every Thursday, the company would air three shows created by screenwriter Shonda Rhimes. Grey's Anatomies, Scandal, and How to Get Away with Murder. They branded it as TGIT on ABC. TGIT stands for Thank God It's Thursday. In addition to promoting the shows, ABC encouraged viewers to make popcorn, drink red wine, and enjoy the evening. Andrew Kublitz, head of scheduling for ABC, Describe the idea behind the campaign. We see Thursday night as a viewership opportunity with either couples or women by themselves who want to sit down and escape and have fun and drink in red wine rather than have some uh, red wine and red wine and have some popcorn. The brilliance of this strategy is that ABC was associating the things they needed viewers to do, which is watch their shows, with activities the viewers already wanted to do. Relax, drink wine, eat popcorn. Over time, people began began to connect watching ABC with feeling relaxed and entertained. If you think red wine and eat popcorn at 8 p.m. every Thursday, and then eventually 8 p.m. on Thursday means relaxation and entertainment. But rewards get associated with the queue. And your habits. Of turning on the television becomes more attractive. You're more likely to find a behavior attractive if you get to do one of your favorite things at the same time. Perhaps you want to hear about the latest celebrity gossip, but you need to get in shape. Using temptation bundling, you could only read the tabloids and watch and watch reality shows at the gym. Maybe you want to get a pedicure, but you need to clean out your email box solution. Only get a pedicure while processing overdue work emails. Temptation building is one way to apply a psychology theory known as pre-man's principle. Named after the work of Professor David Premark, the principle states that more probable behaviors will reinforce less probable behaviors. In other words, even if you don't really want to process overdue work emails, you will become conditions, conditioned to do it if it means you get to do something you really want to do along the way. You can even combine temptation bundling with the habit stacking strategy we discussed in chapter 5 to create a set of rules to guide your behavior. The habit stacking plus temptation building formula is after current habit, I will habit I need. After habit I need, I will habit I want. If you want to read the news, but you need to express more gratitude, say 
after one after I get my morning coffee, I will say one thing I'm grateful for that happened yesterday. After I say one thing I'm grateful for, I will read the news. If you want to watch sports, but you need to make sales calls, say, after I get back from my lunch break, I will call three potential clients needs. After I call three potential clients, I will check ESPN.